Ben, welcome. Thank you. Well, it's been a little while. It's been a while. Always great to have you here. And congrats yeah. on your latest, greatest beast of a book, which everyone's going to need to pick up called Boundless. And this yes. is this is a well, beast. It's hard to actually pick up. It, it is like I think part of that we're going to talk about workouts, and now you've mm. got a book. You don't need dumbbells, barbells. You, don't need you just need the book. This no. is a six hundred yeah, plus it's a two page. For one. It, yeah. it, it's like a five. 10 for one. Yeah. We should probably have like a training program people need to engage in before they get the book. <laughs> the you start book with is resistance so, bands. The book is so big, it is not on this table because yeah. the, it would compromise the integrity of the table. We, we don't want to crack the table. But congratulations. It, it's it got every, it, it is an encyclopedia. It's like the book you're going to like put on your shelf and go back to time and time again. It's, so congratulations. I was actually going to call it Encyclopedia Britannica and I looked it up and that <laughs> name was taken. I couldn't believe somebody already <laughs> took that name. So, uh, well, congrats. And, and there's so much to get through. So this, this is going to be a little bit of a different type of podcast. We're going to okay. cover a, a broad range of topics and, and do a little rapid fire. Steamroll. Yes. All right, let's do so it. <laughs> we're going to start with neurotransmitters what are they why are they critical and what's going on there well it, it, in the book i call them the brain's bumblebees right because they're like these these compounds that reside within your nervous system that the nervous system uses to communicate right you have a a signal that travels down through a nerve and reaches the synapse and then those neurotransmitters get dumped into that synaptic cleft the area in between the synapses and they propagate a signal that's then carried on throughout the body and typically they are excitatory or inhibitory Right, so you've got an excitatory neurotransmitter like dopamine, for example, right? A, a feel good rush of pleasure to your head when you get this release of dopamine that can cause positive habits or addictions. And then you have another neurotransmitter uh, called GABA, a really, really good inhibitory neurotransmitter. As a matter of fact, I keep a, a little bottle of, uh, of GABA extracts next to my bedside because if you wake in the night, it's one of the fastest ways to just flood your body with inhibitory neurotransmitters and get yourself back to sleep. But a lot of people, surprising number of people have neurotransmitter imbalances or dominances. So in the book, uh, I describe a dopamine dominance, a serotonin dominance, a GABA dominance, and an acetylcholine dominance, and then link to a quiz where you can actually go figure out which dominance that you are. And certain people, you know, like very, very, very simple, like uh, I, I tend to err towards serotonin dominance myself. And one of the um, one of the byproducts of that is that I tend to dwell upon things, just grip them like a bulldog and not let go unless I can somehow get them out of my head and onto paper and they'll they'll drive me absolutely nuts. And people who are serotonin dominant, they they thrive very well by, you know, downloading an app like Evernote, right? And putting it on your Kindle, on your phone, and on your computer. So you've got like this three way street where you can just jot anything down that comes to mind, along with, you know, like a little little pilot pen that lights up next to your bed stand in a journal. So you can write things down if you wake up at night to allow you to go back to sleep. Uh, dopamine dominant people just thrive on adventure, right? They're they're bored, just stuck in, you know. Well, let, let's say a GABA dominant person would love to sit and paint for hours, right? And a dopamine person would be, I'll paint, but right, you know, well, I'm waiting to jump out of a plane. So it, it, it's very interesting that you can go through, you can identify your neurotransmitter tendencies. But then uh, what I think is just as important is caring for your neurotransmitters, which tend to become exhausted or imbalanced due to a variety of factors. Probably the number one factor these days is just sensory overload, right? And I encourage people as much as possible to make their home and office almost like a wellness spa, right? Very, as a matter of fact, I went in for, for a chiropractic adjustment the other day. And this guy's office was just like a Zen den, right? Very peaceful music, essential oils, smelled like lavender. The lighting was just perfect, you know, candles and very low lighting. And I've, I've been adjusted in other scenarios, you know, like just, you know, you know like a whitewash clinic type of scenario where you're, where you may be a little bit more tense and my body just melted. And the guy was just like, click, clack, click. And everything just went right into place because I was so relaxed. And if you think about it, excess sensory input that you would be exposed to from the completely opposite scenario, not only does that keep you on the edge, but it causes your body to get, just get flooded over and over again with things like dopamine and serotonin. And so you develop these neurotransmitter imbalances and they, they can be uh, rebalanced, but a, a big part of it is sensory input. Even something as simple as light, 
right? A perfect example of that would be a modern LED lighting or lighting with dimmer switches, right? This, this produces a lot of flicker. Uh, it, it pushes out a lot of light that does not necessarily simulate what we'd be getting from sunlight or in the evening, what we'd be getting after the sunlight is gone. So for example, in our bedroom, we have incandescent light bulbs, incandescent red light bulbs in my children's bedroom and in my, my uh, wife's and mine bedroom. And it's just very calming. You walk in or if you get up at, at night to pee and you got to put on the light, it's not like something blasting you in the face. I went so far as to get this, uh, you, you can buy this kind of like red uh, tape on Amazon. And not that I would ever get up at night to open the refrigerator and grab a snack, but let's just say just in case I did, uh, I have the the actual refrigerator light is covered with this red tape. So when you open the refrigerator at night, it's it's also not this blast in the face of light. But you begin to just think about your environment throughout the day and how many times you're blasting your senses. And I consider caring for your neurotransmitters uh, a process of being aware of how much sensory input that that you're exposing yourself into, and and even compounds can be. Uh, sensory overloads, you know, like uh, coffee, for example, right? Like excess caffeine or regularly dosed caffeine without breaks from caffeine can cause increased neurotransmitter turnover, especially these excitatory neurotransmitters. Uh, one one kind of hack for that is you simply switch to decaf coffee for about five to seven days every one to two months. And what that does is it resets these receptors called adenosine receptors. So when you drink coffee and coffee and coffee over and over again, you build up a ton of these adenosine receptors and, and caffeine can bind to those receptors. And what caffeine is doing when it binds to those receptors is it's keeping this molecule called adenosine from binding to those receptors. And adenosine is is what makes you sleepy. Now, sure, if you're cutting off your coffee intake by noon, which you know I, I think is a smart idea for deeper sleep later on in the day, the coffee or the caffeine is not necessarily going to be bound to that adenosine receptor when it's time for you to go to bed. But the body creates all these extra adenosine receptors that are getting flooded by caffeine earlier in the day, so you need that much more adenosine to feel sleepy. And it turns out it takes about five to seven days to reset that adenosine receptor sensitivity and to get rid of some of those excess adenosine receptors. And so you can just kind of play with your coffee and switch to decaf, do a washout period every once in a while. But you are a fan of coffee. I do like coffee. You saw me out there. I think I've had I've had two cups since I got here. Admittedly, it was decaf. I, I love just the taste of coffee. Coffee. I, well, A, I love what coffee does to my morning wakefulness and my morning bowel movement. And then later on in the day, I just I, I love a cup of decaf coffee, just like dark black rich decaf coffee. I go for the real thing. I love coffee. Yeah. I also you mentioned GABA. I love pharma GABA. It's in our magnesium plus product. Yeah. I take it every night, and and I have the same thing. I don't. I never really had a problem sleeping, but I would like twist and turn a little mm -hmm. bit, like sort of wake up in the middle, but like. Not with pharma, yeah. not with GABA. Yeah, yeah. Pharma GABA is pretty useful. And probably the only other two sleep aids that I like, uh, A, if you're aging or if you're traveling, melatonin is wonderful. Your, your melatonin not production- a, Not daily though. Well, your melatonin production is going to decrease as you age. And I actually think it is a good idea for people who are getting older to begin to introduce like 0 0.3 milligrams of melatonin, 0 0.5, 1, up to 3 milligrams of melatonin on a nightly basis. Because if you find that if you're tracking your sleep, you know, with a ring or a wristband or whatnot, and you're noticing that as you as you age, your sleep latency is increasing, meaning how long it takes you to fall asleep or your deep sleep is declining, you can supplement with melatonin just to replace what your body isn't making. Very similar to how you know a lot of aging females will begin to supplement with progesterone hormone or or men with like a testosterone cream just to replace some of what your body isn't making anymore as you age, just so you maintain higher quality of life. In addition to, to uh, aging people, melatonin's awesome for resetting the circadian rhythm when you're traveling, when you've crossed multiple that's, time that's zones. That's my, what I tend to hear a lot is mel melatonin's great for jet lag. It's one, like a mega dose of it, a mega yeah. dose of it just on the first night. So I just flew into New York City last night and I took 100 milligrams of melatonin at about 9 p.m. And I actually, I bypass gastric absorption because it's not that well absorbed unless you have like a liposomal spray that you can keep in your mouth. I use a melatonin suppository 
and it, it just goes you know, straight in through the rectal delivery system and you get this slow bleed of melatonin into your system during the night. And that works really, really well for a mega dose of melatonin. There's a, a doctor I found out in Florida, Dr. John Laurence, who, uh, who makes these melatonin suppositories. And he also makes CBD, which, which I'm in addition, a huge fan of that for sleep for people whose sleep related problems are due to anxiety or racing thoughts. Targeting the endocannabinoid system is, is really good for that. THC tends to disrupt your deep sleep cycles, uh, can disrupt dream cycles, which are important for, for learning and, and consolidation and memory. Um, but the, the only issue with CBD is that most of the studies on CBD show that an effective dose is 300 to 600 milligrams for sleep. A lower dose will help a little bit with anxiety. And some people will even use a lower dose as almost kind of like a nootropic pick me up, like 10 to 20 milligrams, but you need a lot. When you consider the average bottle of CBD is a 10 milligram dose, you know, you'd basically have to take half the bottle to get the equivalent of what research has shown to improve a night of sleep. For a lot of people too, it can cause them to focus a bit. Mm -hmm. They take it toward bedtime. Right. So it's like uh, early, it's more like- no, Not if you take that much. If you take that yeah. much, but for yeah. a lot of people, depending on the dosage that become a little more focused. So, mm -hmm. you know, maybe better take like right after work versus yeah. right before bed, yeah. but everyone's different. Yeah. And it, and it does have a pretty good effect in terms of its anti-inflammatory effects in neural tissue. And so if you were going to use CBD for focus and your lack of focus or, or brain fog or cognitive issues were related to inflammation, maybe, you know, vegetable oil, or we, we know gluten is a little bit of a nervous system inflammatory agent, you know, some kind of meal the night before, poor sleep, alcohol, especially, uh, you can now get CBD nasal sprays and just basically get it mainline straight into neural tissue. So on the subject of the brain, we hear leaky gut a lot, but you don't hear leaky brain, which you talk about in the book. What's leaky yeah. brain? Well, leaky brain would be a, a, a porous blood brain barrier. So in the same way that the gut can become more permeable to large proteins that might cross the gut blood barrier and result in inflammation or some kind of, some kind of immunogenic response with, well, I mean, uh, gluten is a perfect example, right? If you consume modern wheat specifically that has been treated with herbicides and pesticides, the herbicides and pesticides such as glyphosate can cause mild damage to the cell wall in the gut. And the gluten that would normally not be absorbed in large protein particles into the bloodstream but winds up in the bloodstream and that's where you get some of those immune system reactions and inflammation. With the brain, it's kind of similar. You can get particles crossing the brain. You can get brain inflammation due to a compromised blood brain barrier. And there are, there are certain things that can contribute to that with the two biggest being stress and sleep, like high levels of chronic stress and low sleep can result in blood brain barrier leakage. Uh, another very common uh, factor would be a magnesium deficiency. Like if you go out and you get a what's called a red blood cell test for magnesium, many people are notoriously low in magnesium. So that's that's very important for the blood brain barrier. It turns out that you know, speaking of coffees and teas, like anything rich in some of these polyphenols and anthocyanins, that it's actually good for the blood brain barrier. But of course, there's that sweet spot because you don't want to drink so much coffee that you're exhausting your your neurotransmitters. It's not something that's very easily tested. Uh, there, there's there's one kind of fringe test that you can use to see if you're creating some compounds that could indicate blood brain barrier permeability very similar to neurotransmitters there's there's not many great tests out there for testing your urine neurotransmitter status yet because it's questionable whether what you're testing in the urine and what's in the body is actually reflecting what's in the brain. And the same thing goes for blood brain barrier leakage. Uh, but if you struggle with, with brain fog, uh, poor sleep, uh, you know, short term memory issues, things like that, sometimes it can be a sign that you've got blood brain barrier issues going on. So you mentioned poor sleep and the reality is sometimes poor sleep just happens. You know, we have two little kids. I, I had it last night, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, sometimes it just happens. So in the book, you say, you talk about how, how we can mitigate damage of a bad night's sleep. So how, how can we mitigate that damage? Because you know what? Life happens and so does bad sleep. Well, A, don't have children. That's step one. <laughs> um, no, children are wonderful. I, I have two. The lost sleep piece is interesting. What I find most interesting is the research on exercise and exercise's ability to be able to mitigate some of the cognitive issues that occur from a lost night of sleep. 
Uh, for example, one study showed that multiple small, intense 10 minute exercise sessions during the day induced wakefulness and cognition that would normally have been compromised due to a lost night of sleep. So you might think, well, I'm super sleepy. There's no way I want to go to the gym anyways today, but three times today, I'm going to do a, let's say, air squat push up and maybe you've got a light kettlebell around you're going to throw you know a few kettlebell swings or, or lunges or something like that and they're very brief 10 minute exercise sessions that's that's one strategy from an exercise standpoint in addition it's shown that aerobic exercise just like steady state aerobic exercise which seems to get kind of a bad rap these days because everybody wants to do high intensity interval training or high intensity repeat training or strength training, but aerobic cardio can actually be very good when you have a lost night of sleep or, or poor sleep. So is that your, a jog or is that up. like a quick paced walk or this would a quick be paced hike? Like a, or? a brisk walk in the sunshine, right? So which is even better because then you're getting the, the infrared and red light from sunlight, which can also induce wakefulness and help a little bit with nitric oxide production. So you get more blood flow to the brain that can give you a little bit of a wakefulness effect. Um, and then I'm a huge fan of power naps. So <laughs> I, I mean, I, I pull out all the stops on my naps and I, I, uh, for example, I'm a big fan of these vagal nerve stimulators. So you can now get devices that will stimulate the vagus nerve, which is this nerve that wanders throughout the entire body, innervates the gut, uh, can tend to become kind of skewed towards sympathetic nervous system activation. So you can be in a little bit more fight or flighty mode if you have poor vagal nerve tone. Well, there are devices like the like uh, Fisher Wallace makes one called the Circadia. Uh, there's another one called what the, you just, the like, uh, New Calm. Yeah, you you put it's these like a Theragun for yeah. You, well, you, you <laughs> place these electrodes typically on either side of your neck or uh, other other side of your uh, temporal lobes, and then you let these things run, and you just feel yourself washed over with this relaxation. And so I'm a, I'm a huge fan of slapping those on for a nap. I use typically like some kind of essential oil. You know, usually lavender, something like that. Uh, noise blocking headphones with a really good sleep mask. So I use one called Mind Alive. This sleep mask that just blocks everything out. It was originally designed, I think, for like you know plant medicine journeys, MDMA and psilocybin and all that jazz. Because you can't see anything, but it's, it's perfect for sleep too. This this Mind Alive mask, and then um, typically some kind of beats that I'll play while I'm asleep. Um, that new Calm device that I talked about that comes with its own app. It's got like this power nap session, and I'll play one to two rounds of that. So it's a it's a twenty minute session. But if I've got extra time, I'll, I'll do forty minutes. And then uh, the other one that I really like is brain fm they have these really cool little like mini nap power nap type of sessions and those work really well also so as you, you mentioned noise canceling headphones it reminds me of, of flying and in the book you also have a five-step airplane sleep system oh now i have to remember all five steps uh let's well, see you, you're jet lagged <laughs> so, and you haven't yeah, had enough coffee yeah, yet. yeah no i'm i'm not jet lagged I, I feel pretty good actually after all that melatonin last night uh the, <laughs> very controversial yeah, a lot of people are not fans of melatonin yeah, i am i am it, it's got some pretty potent anti-inflammatory and antioxidant effects too so so i like it i'm sold um anyways though the the five-step sleep system uh i can tell you some of the components i have to remember this almost well, like a window so, aisle yeah, yeah. So, excuse me, window over the so aisle. So, I use a J hook neck pillow, which you can buy on Amazon, and it is a neck pillow that works for side sleepers versus the standard neck pillow. So, it kind of wraps around your body and it's inflatable. So, it compresses down into my bag. Then, when I get into my window seat, which I always select if I can, I put that J hook pillow on and it kind of nestles between me and the window. So, it feels like you're side sleeping. Uh, the next one is Rishi Mushroom. So compared to anything else that I've found that relaxes you, but still allows you to wake without being groggy for a nap, Rishi works really well. So typically I'll use something like uh, Four Sigmatic or Real Mushrooms and just take a, a decent amount of Rishi extract. Like if I'm using Four Sigmatic, usually it's a, a couple packets of that. Uh, step three is to block out all sensory input. So that's when I'll, I'll go to like the, the sleep mask and the headphones that I talked about. Step four is some kind of noise. So that's where I'll use, you know, again, something like Brain FM or New Calm. And then uh, I'm trying to remember what step five is. It's, it's, uh, do you do breath work on the plane too? I do. And I can explain what I do in a second. Um, I'm trying to remember step five. It is, um, mm -mm -mm. 
I'm blanking. I need my book in front of me now. All good. Yeah, yeah. I I, I may have actually mixed uh, mixed a few extra steps in there as well. But either, either way, good. Read, read the book. It's it's in there <laughs> with um. Uh, what were you asking me? Breath work was, on yeah. the plane. So the breath work. There, there's a lot of different breath work um, protocols that I like, but my favorites for sleep are four eight breathing. Uh, Dr. Andrew Weil, who I interviewed on my podcast some time ago, is a big fan of four, seven, eight breathing, four so count inhale, in, inhale, hold, seven X. count, hold, eight count out. I've never found that seven count hold to be very relaxing. It always seems like I'm kind of like on the tail end of my breath and I kind of get it, get a little bit winded. And then finally I breathe out. So I instead just do four in and eight out. So that's one form of breath work. And that's typically one that I'll use as I'm falling asleep for meditation or for winding the body down. I like box breathing. Yep. Four, just four, four, four in, four hold, four out, four hold, four hold. And then for just like a quick breath snack to kind of down regulate the sympathetic nervous, maybe I've blasted through 20 emails and I can feel my heart rate racing, my body's tight, alternate nostril, right? In through the right nostril, cover the right nostril, out through the left nostril. And just doing a few rounds of that for about a minute can work really well. And you can, you can track and test which breath work protocol that your body responds best to with HRV. So you need a real time HRV measurement, and there are straps now, like the Bio Strap and the Elite HRV Strap, the Nature Beat app. The Aura has a new feature called Moment, and you can track in real time and actually see which form of breath work is really truly activating your parasympathetic nervous system. I and, love the double exhale. Just yeah. inhale for two, three, yeah. four, and just double the yeah. exhale. Whatever you do, yeah. it works. It's so easy too. If you talk to anyone, it's like, wait, can you just do this? <laughs> inhale for two and yeah. exhale for four. It's like, who can't do that in a yeah. stressful situation? Yeah. I, I love breath work because it's, a, you know, compared to like whatever, you know, taking phosphatidylserine at night to lower cortisol or, you know, even using like a vagal nerve stimulator or something like that. Breath work is free. It's already inside of you. And um, the, the other thing about breath work would be uh, one, one that I use just a couple of times a month, and that would be holotropic breath work, which was originally kind of designed by Stanislav Grof as an alternative to LSD just because of the supposed DMT release that you get from it. But I lay flat on my back, usually in my sauna, and do about an hour of, it kind of starts slow, like, and by the end it's, and after about five minutes of doing rounds like that, you will exhale all your air and hold it for as long as you can, then inhale and hold for as long as you can, and then repeat. And by the time you get to 60 minutes, your inspiratory and expiratory muscles are, are gassed. Your, your diaphragm hurts. The next day, you can feel some of those breathing muscles are actually kind of sore and fatigued. But man, to, to take you to a freaking other planet without the actual use of any plant medicines, holotropic breath work is, is some pretty cool stuff. It's intense. Yeah. Very intense. Yeah. So uh, I, I want to pick up we were talking about working out. Something you talk about in the book is specific weight training. That there, there's some weight training that's better than others in terms of being more effective. Mm -hmm. So, what is the best type of training for your for your average? You know, right. not, not for, for your for the non-performance enthusiast. <laughs> yes, for no, the average person. <laughs> right, right. Because if you if you want to get fit as fast as possible, you know, li lifting heavy loads under metabolically stressed conditions can do that. Right, something like a CrossFit workout where you are lifting heavy loads, typically somewhat gassed, that is going to get you fit pretty quickly. Uh, however, it also has higher risk of injury. And my, my real goal in Boundless was to give people workout methods that would keep them fit for life without setting them up for injury. And because of that, the, the two best ways, in my opinion, to weight train are A, some form of super slow training. Because if you look at the work of, say, a guy like Dr. Doug McGuff, who wrote the book Body by Science, he shows that the, the peripheral blood pressure response that occurs when you're lifting a weight very, very slowly kind of traps some lactic acid and it can improve blood pressure parameters. And also because of that lactic acid burn, cause this pretty profound growth hormone response that occurs after you finish the set. And so this is something that you only need to do one to two times a week, but it's basically a very super slow single set to failure where you're going for time under tension on the muscle for 90 seconds plus. So it'd be something like chest press, pull down, shoulder press, row, leg press, or squat, right? And you're doing one single set, very slow, very slow up, 
very slow so down. So like slow as in like five like, seconds like up, five cent- seconds down? Centimeters at a time forward. So it's, it's a little bit mentally demanding because you're pushing the weight so slowly. Uh, but it's it's very, very effective at maintaining strength with a low risk of injury. It's not going to create functional explosive athleticism. Which- but it's very, very effective for cardiovascular and for strength, especially if you don't want to stress your joints. And some people who are a little bit more athletic, I'll give them a program like that. But at the very end of that super slow set, when they're just almost gassed, I'll have them just do a few extra reps where they're kind of like pushing powerfully and explosively and we're hitting some of that fast twitch muscle at the end of the set. So that's the first type. Of okay. Can you give me a like. sense of time though, in terms of when you're pushing up and down, is it Three seconds, five seconds, oh, ten. T- 10 to 15 seconds. Wow. Like so 10 seconds press, to 10 get to 15 up. seconds forward, 10 to 15 seconds what back. What about for a pull up, for example? Same thing for, for so all of them. 10 up and down. Yeah. So a pull up, super... unlikely you would do this unless you were using a pull down or an assisted pull up machine, just because it, for it's most <laughs> people, it's very hard to do a set of super slow pull ups and, and make it past 90 seconds. And how many reps in a set? Reps don't matter. So you, like, you just go to failure, but most people get about five to eight reps in. Got it. Yeah. And then what you're missing on that, and, and this is you know based on some interesting research that was done in power lifters versus other forms of strength training and telomere length, right? Like actual longevity induced by strength training. And it turns out that the fast twitch powerful explosive muscles are more favorable for overall longevity. The problem, of course, is that doesn't mean that you need to go and do CrossFit or powerlifting. You can do very short, powerful, quick, explosive exercises, body weight only. So what I like to do is pair a couple of times a week the super slow training with a couple of times a week something more like a, a New York Times seven-minute workout, right? Or one of these body weight training apps where you're just moving very quickly and explosively, 30 seconds on, 15 seconds off, plyometrics, lunges, you know, explosive push-ups, things like that. And one thing I really like that's kind of the icing on the cake that I discuss a little bit in the book is the use of blood flow restriction. And this is a form of exercise that comes out of Japan that basically involves uh, occluding the muscles with almost like a fancy tourniquet, which is usually an elastic band or some form of elastic tubing. So the, the bands would go close to the shoulder at the top of the arms and then also close to the crotch at the top of the thighs. And what these do is they restrict blood to the extremities that you're using. When that happens, the muscle thinks it's under a very heavy load. The muscle thinks it's getting injured. It also accumulates a ton of lactic acid inside that muscle that cannot be removed. So when you do the set, after you take the straps off, what happens are two things. A, a very pronounced growth hormone response because the muscles have been occluded or some blood flow has been cut off to the muscles during the training. And then the other thing is uh, what's called satellite cell proliferation, meaning your body actually bounces back and makes new muscle fibers in a manner very similar to the way it would have done if you'd lifted heavy weights, even though with this occlusion training, you don't need to lift heavy weights. So if you want kind of the icing on the cake for a super slow strength training session or one of these body weight explosive sessions, you can actually use blood flow restriction bands uh, or another form. The, the, the one they typically use in Japan, is these are called katsu devices. K-A-A-T-S-U. Blood flow restriction bands you can buy on Amazon, and they're literally just like elastic straps that you put on your thighs or your arms prior to a workout. The Katsu device is more expensive. It actually has a little handheld controller that very precisely controls the millimeters of mercury of pressure that are around each joint. So you can you can set it up extremely precisely. So it's a little, little bit more slick, a little bit more advanced and, and more precise, but uh, most people do pretty well with just the the BFR bands. And it's, it's nice if you're in a hotel room and you just want to do whatever, push-ups, squats, and lunges and fool your body into thinking it's lifting a heavier weight. Well, just the practice of going super slow with regards to you know push-up or lifting weight, we're talking five to 10 minutes. Yeah. Everyone's got yeah. that time. Yeah. You can do that. Right. This is not like an hour in the gym. Or two no, hours. The, the, the super slow protocol, we're talking 15 to 20 minutes. The body weight protocol, 10 to 20 yeah. minutes. So the, these are pretty, pretty quick workout snacks. And that's not all you would need to do to maintain optimum levels of fitness, right? You're still going to need to do like some some fasted walks to improve your metabolic efficiency. You're still going to need to do a little bit of high intensity interval training here and there to make sure your, your oxygen utilization stays elevated. Like there are 
you know, for me with a background in exercise physiology, I step back and look at the body as a collection of different metabolic systems and ask myself, okay, is this workout program targeting each of the different metabolic systems, lactic acid tolerance, mitochondrial density, fat burning efficiency, strength, power, mobility. And then what you do is you just sprinkle in throughout the week, little workout sessions that hit each of those different parameters. So then you ensure you've got more of what I what I would call kind of like being the the Batman of fitness, right? You could be like the Flash of fitness and be really fast, but kind of you know skinny and potentially weak. Or you could be the Hulk, you know, have huge muscles but poor aerobic capacity. Or you could be like Batman and just kind of have a little bit of everything, you know, power, strength, speed, endurance, mobility. And so that combined with lifespan, right, and and being able to actually just just last and feel good uh, is is the type of workout program that I that I went after for Boundless. So you mentioned fat burning. What's holding us back there? A lot of stuff. Um, <laughs> so I, I would say probably the the number one thing I still see that shocks me for fat burning are what I would define as glycemic excursions during the day, meaning that. In an ideal scenario, the substrate that your body is using, if you want to burn fat, is fatty acids. And to get your body into a state where it's burning fatty acids on, on a pretty frequent basis, um, aside from eating huge amounts of fat, which has been shown in research to shift you towards more fatty acid utilization, uh, and the problem with that is, of course, you're eating a ton of calories if you're eating a, a high amount of fat. The other way to do it is to simply go long periods of time between eating, to have compressed feeding windows, to engage in intermittent fasting. And I, I was over at a friend's house two days ago, and he's on he's on like the one meal a day, you know, compressed feeding window type of scenario, or at least says he is. And you know, I walk past him, and he's got this big you know bowl of, of mixed deluxe nuts on the counter, and you know, twice I saw him just grab a big handful of those and and mow down on them. And I'm not judging as much as saying that. People will mindlessly grab snacks throughout the day that shift them completely out of their fatty acid utilization or put calories into the body that the body has to burn before it taps into its own fat. So I'm a huge fan of compressed feeding windows, usually for men, at least a 12 to 16 hour intermittent fasting window at some point, as many days of the year as possible. Women usually closer to about 10 to 12 hours, especially lean active women, because you tend to see a down regulation of fertility and luteinizing hormone and gonadotropin releasing hormone. All these important hormones tend to get down regulated in, in active women who have an excessive intermittent fasting window. But generally some form of intermittent fast combined with very astute attention paid to not grazing, not snacking, you know, find yourself like some some really good sparkling water or, or water or some non-caloric beverage that you like, like tea or coffee. Get yourself some really good, you know, peppermint oil gum or you know, like a natural gum you can use to keep the appetite satiated. Then just don't snack, don't graze. I used to tell people when I was a personal trainer to eat six to ten small meals a day to keep the metabolism elevated. Isn't it funny how these things yeah. change? Yeah. Yeah. They don't <laughs> they, I don't think they change as much as research shows us how wrong. wrong we were. It's not like the human body is evolving and it changing. It makes you think, yeah. what are we gonna be wrong about today that in ten years you know, right. it's it's uh, right. I remember I used to swear by breakfast like a king, yeah. lunch like yeah. a, mm -hmm. a prince, dinner like a pauper. And there are some yeah. you know that's a little nuanced because some people will argue that you should have bigger meals. Like you, you better off having your mm -hmm. last meal, like one yeah. to 2 PM, but that's yeah. just like not practical yeah, for right. people who <laughs> It's have all families. dependent on the scenario too, right? People with families, I, my biggest meal of the day is always dinner right? and I don't eat any carbohydrates until dinner. So my body is in a state of, of fatty acid oxidation all day long. And then I'll have some of Jess's sourdough bread or some dark chocolate or red wine or, you know, something with dinner. Um, and then the other piece is that it can sometimes be situation dependent, right? I am not a big breakfast guy just because I have that that you know later dinner, and I know that's that's my big meal. That's when I'm going to be eating a hefty portion of calories. But when I'm traveling, I break that rule because we know that one of the best ways to reset the circadian rhythm after travel. I already talked about melatonin. Uh, you know, light is another one. Blasting yourself with sunlight in the morning, but a regularly timed, decent meal at the in the time zone of when people would normally be eating wherever you travel to is a good way to reset the circadian rhythm. So when I travel, you know, uh, this morning, you know, I, I normally would have either fasted through breakfast or had some light coffee or a very small smoothie or something like that. And this morning at about nine a.m., I had a pretty decent size. It was like this little 
protein spiralina bowl is probably like 800 calories, but I'll do that when I'm traveling to get the metabolic rate going and, and jumpstart the circadian rhythm. But that's not a habit that I adopt that much at home. So it kind of depends on your scenario too. Or if you're an athlete, right? We know that athletes who are training twice a day, which many athletes do, you know, they'll have a workout at one point in the day, then a scrimmage later on, or vice versa. It takes eight hours for your carbohydrate levels to become replenished after a workout. So for those type of people, they have to have a big meal after that first workout of the day to adequately be ready for the next workout later on. But in the general population, there's no need to, to you know, drop away and go have a post-workout meal right away because everything's going to be refueled by the time you get to your next workout. So that, that, that's a question I was going to ask. So you, you tell me where the science is today. It used to be when you worked out, there was a certain time frame where you were mm-hmm. supposed to get your protein. Right. Your what's way, your take your, on your that? Whatever it is, your collagen, like what's your take on that today? What's the, what's well, the time window or is there no yeah, window? There, there are two considerations for that. Um, consideration a is that these studies were done in athletes for whom performance was being optimized. Therefore they're looking at how quickly can we restore muscle glycogen levels and enhance muscle protein synthesis. They weren't looking at blood sugar levels throughout the day. They weren't looking at activation of mTOR and longevity. All they were looking at was how can we refill the body's energy stores as quickly as possible. And it is true that if you can get a meal in 10 minutes after the workout versus two hours after the workout, you're going to more rapidly replenish glycogen levels. You're going to get bigger amounts of muscle protein synthesis. But unless you're working out again within eight hours again, (laughs) it's not necessary. So this is kind of like trickle down advice from more of like the pro athlete to a day type of type right. of you know exercise enthusiast the other thing is that the majority of those workouts were or were or those studies on post workout nutrition were done in people who were in an overnight fasted state so this also means that if your workout is at 10 a.m. and you've had breakfast at 8:30 a.m. the amount of amino acids and glucose that you have in your bloodstream from breakfast is much higher than what you would have seen in those studies, right? So arguably, if you're waking up and working out hard in a fasted state, the benefits of you having a post-workout meal are going to be much higher than if you were working out after you've had breakfast or after you've had lunch, at, in which case, you know, there's there's no need to go rush to find your protein shake when you're still burping up your pre-workout energy bar. So basically. so perfect scenario or ideal scenario is you you fast for an extended period of time, and then you work out, then you have your, your protein shake. Or you are working out, let's say at 4 p.m. in the afternoon, you had lunch at one, right. but then after you finish that 4 p.m. workout, uh, let's say at five, you don't eat until dinner at seven or 7.30. And there's even some research showing that when you don't eat for a few hours after workout, you get an increase in growth hormone and testosterone. So. The exceptions to this rule would, of course, be the athletes that I mentioned or people who want to put on size, right? right? Like bodybuilders, you know, high school football players. That's another scenario where you want to maximize that muscle protein synthesis and actually get a protein rich meal in after workout. But for the purposes of longevity, hormones, uh, staving off some of those, those uh, you know, glycemic variability excursions, uh, tapping into more fatty acids as a fuel, et cetera. I'm a fan of that fasted workout. And then you have a meal you know, just within you know, anywhere from 20 minutes up to two hours after the workout or fed workout, but then not feeling the pressure to eat after the workout and just waiting until the next normally timed meal would occur. I'll typically fast, do a very quick workout at lunch and then have a grass-fed collagen smoothie. That That's how I'll tend yeah. to do it. Because for me, time is just... Yeah. The, <laughs> yeah. And that, that's a good minutes. scenario. And there are, there are little tricks. I mean, for example, you could use, um, if, if you don't want to catabolize too much muscle, you could take like amino acids before a fasted workout sure. to give your body amino acids, but not cause it to, to catabolize its own tissue. Another example would be, uh, like liquid ketones, like ketone esters or ketone salts. They're pretty low calorie, relatively non-insulinogenic. They give you a, a good surge of energy, but they don't really take you out of that fasted state that you're going after during the workout. So I can't let it slip that you talked about sourdough, my oh, favorite yeah. bread. I did see your, your ears perk I, up. I perk up. Let's just stop earphones. right there. Yeah. So you're, you're a fan of sour, sourdough. Gluten's not, you know, 
all 100 well, percent evil then i think gluten's making a comeback yeah i'm sure most people know <laughs> now that you know the fermentation process of sourdough pre-digests a lot of the gluten and and it deactivates a lot of the phytic acids and other things that wouldn't inhibit mineral absorption or, or cause damage to the gut this longer fermentation process which, which i'm a fan of for just about any plant food you know for quinoa i like to to rinse it to soak it overnight. Typically, I'll leave it in the jar after a second rinsing to sprout a little bit. Right, So the quinoa, the saponins on the exterior surface of the quinoa become far more digestible. The same could be said for most legumes. Um, milk, right? We know that a, a good fermented milk, like I, I like to make kefir these days. And so I've got kefir grains that I put raw milk into. The kefir grains will digest all the lactose sugars in the milk. And so all I have left over is this very bacteria protein rich beverage that I can drink. And so any of these kind of like old world or, or ancestral fermentation, soaking, sprouting type of practices will typically render the plant defense mechanisms in a plant-based food far less damaging to the gut. It's actually one one failure, I think, uh, of a lot of more vegan or vegetarian or plant-based diets is lack of attentiveness to proper food preparation tactics that, that would protect the gut in the same way that I think it would be silly for someone who is omnivorous to do a lot of raw meat and raw fish and, you know, like whatever like uh, butcher a pig and you know have some raw pork belly like that's dangerous right it's just, it's just I don't think most of us are doing that food. anyway but right <laughs> but but people are kind of doing the equivalent of that sure. with vegetables sure right and and aside from some greens you know there are, there's some plants that are pretty clean and don't have a lot of built-in defense mechanisms like let's see a cucumber um, a lot of foods need to be prepared properly and so my wife does a she does a wonderful sourdough bread, sourdough cinnamon rolls, sourdough pizza, and it's amazing. I love it. So yeah. also with sourdough, I'd be remiss if I didn't, you also said wine, and but you've got a great, great little blurb in the book about how to never get a hangover again. What okay. are your tips there? A um, couple of things. One, don't drink. Yeah, one, don't drink. <laughs> no, do, do drink. Uh, as a matter of fact, back to the blood-brain barrier, microdoses of alcohol, small amounts of alcohol have been shown to actually increase the integrity of the blood-brain barrier, while large amounts of ethanol will increase the permeability of the blood-brain barrier. For so, so small amounts of alcohol on a daily or on a frequent it's basis. like a glass of wine. Exactly. Or... Those actually have mild neuroprotective effects. Now, the first step would be, of course, choosing your alcohol carefully. Um, for me, it's typically any wine that is organic or biodynamic, meaning it, it has not been irrigated heavily for a mm -hmm. big, sugary, low antioxidant grape, but instead would be derived from a low sugar, higher antioxidant grape, uh, and also filtered to filter out any of the pesticides or herbicides, or preferably not even from a vineyard that is used, pesticides and herbicides. So there are some countries when I roll into a steakhouse, that I know are decently safe to look at when I'm ordering wine off the menu with Italy, yep. France, and New Zealand yep. being the best three. So a good organic biodynamic wine. Uh, the other thing that I like is a drink that I affectionately named after myself called the Ben and Jitters. And all it is- I affectionately is, named after it's, myself. <laughs> it's on the rocks, a little squeeze of lemon or lime, selection of house bitters which and bitters are fantastic because not only do they assist with the production of digestive enzymes when you have a, a bitter forward cocktail prior to a meal but they also enhance what's called your first phase insulin response meaning that you get a better insulin response during the meal and a lower blood glucose after the meal right so a bitters forward cocktail is, is really good for this so little lemon or lime which is a bit of a bitter and a digestive in and of itself a splash or a selection of, of house bitters and if you're at a good bar a lot of times they're they're making their own bitters and then a really clean burning alcohol and for this of course as the name implies i like gin so it's a it's a ben Oof. and jitters and it's basically gin with bitters Bitters, on the rocks, a little lemon or lime. That's my go-to. Or I'll look if I'm looking at a specialty cocktail menu for something that's the, that's you know the approximate equivalent of a bitter forward cocktail. So that's step one would be to, to choose your alcohol wisely. Another one would be I'm a huge fan of coconut charcoal, like activated coconut charcoal 
for just sopping up any of the acetaldehyde, any of the ethanol byproducts, you know, let's say maybe the wine wasn't organic and had pesticides in it. I always have five or six of those capsules back at the bedside, you know, so that I remember to take them before I go to bed. I also like any type of hypertonic mineral solution. This would be, you know, in in a pinch, pun intended, you could use like a really good mineral rich salt, like uh, Celtic salt, for example. Uh, but I like uh, these hypertonic minerals like uh, AquaTrue makes one. Uh, Quicksilver Scientific has one called uh, Quinton. Uh, so does uh, Water and Wellness. But, but any of these really kind of salty, mineral-rich type of liquids or capsules or powders that you can take, those are also very good. And then th th there's a I've got like three whole pages in the book of what to do to manage a party. But uh, one of the other really, really effective uh, antioxidants that will also protect the blood brain barrier, a lot of people recommend glutathione. And glutathione is pretty effective, notoriously poorly absorbed in the gut. So you need to get like a liposomal glutathione or uh, back to the suppositories, like a glutathione suppository or, or intramuscular glutathione shot or something like that. But N-acetylcysteine, NAC, is even more powerful than glutathione, particularly at protecting the brain. And so uh, there's uh, there's one company, uh, Pharmanac, they do like an effervescent uh, NAC tablet that you can use for this. I'll use Thorne's NAC when mm -hmm. I have sinus infections. That's yeah. part of my uh, yeah. side. I get like sinus infections like every fall. Yeah. It's like, like clockwork and sometimes mm -hmm. it can be pretty brutal. So I go to Frank Lippmann, <laughs> Lippmann and yeah. I have like the protocol NAC is part of it. Yeah. The other one that works really well for sinus infections is a nebulizer. You ever use a nebulizer? No. Okay. So it's, so it's basically like this mask that goes over your face that you're breathing a certain solution through and you can nebulize glutathione. That's amazing for a sinus infection. It takes like 20 minutes. You put the mask over your face while you're reading a book or whatever, and you can buy little portable nebulizers, you know, off Amazon, then get liquid glutathione and you nebulize the glutathione. So you chose so gin over tequila. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just a bigger fan. I haven't drank gin since 1991. Yeah. Tequila actually makes me feel, maybe it's, maybe it's just because of how much I drank in college. It just makes me feel funny. Well, but, to say, I, I haven't. Yeah. The last time I had gin, it was very bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, it's, I, pretty, it's pretty clean. I'll now. do tequila and mezcal a little yeah. bit here and there. But yeah. it's a good point on wine because there are so many great producers in those regions. We had a yeah. podcast with Ryan Hardy, who I got introduced to through Frank. He's, uh -huh. um, he's got amazing, uh, he's really passionate about bread, specifically sourdough and fermentation. And he was reeling off all these producers in Italy in the same regions where that's just the way they make wine. Yeah, They don't really advertise it, but if you read the label, biodynamic. Yeah, no, that's it's, the tricky it's, part it's, is it's expensive for some of these places to be like uh, you know, yeah, certified so do organic. Yeah. But um, yeah, if it's from a, a small farm in Italy or France, you know, a lot of times it is already biodynamic organic wine. Yeah. So we're also fans of, of, of two of my favorites because they're in our NR plus formula, nicotinamide, riboside, and astaxanthin. And I got a kick. Yes. They were right next to each other in your book. And in I'm book, like, those are our two leading ingredients. Yeah. We like the same thing. So we'll talk about NR yeah. and then astaxanthin, why you like them so Dude, much. I've, I've got probably over 30 different compounds from, from peptides to hormonal precursors in the anti-aging chapter, but two biggies as far as really good research behind them for their cell protective or DNA protective effects would be some kind of a nicotinamide precursor and then astaxanthin. Matter of fact, the research on astaxanthin that I found particularly for uh, protection of the cell membrane, it's it's impressive. It's very impressive. Now, I used to use astaxanthin as like edible sunscreen because I would go race the Ironman triathlon in Kona every year. And there was a really good astaxanthin producer down there. So I'd take about 40 milligrams of astaxanthin before and after the race. And compared to my hot, you know, sun-infused races where I didn't do that, the amount of skin damage was, was remarkably lower as far as like the redness, how long it took the skin to heal, et cetera. So astaxanthin is wonderful for that. It's wonderful if you're taking like a fish oil because it helps to protect any of the rancidity or the oxygen oxidized oils that might be in a fish oil. Uh, it would be perfect to use after you've had a meal that might have canola oil or vegetable oils in it. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, as, as like a daily cellular protective compound, I really like it. I love it. I think it's so underrated. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other one, uh, NR or nicotinamide riboside is 
one of, of three different compounds that are favored right now to keep your NAD levels elevated, with NAD being very important as a crucial part of your electron transport chain, meaning your, your production of ATP is relatively dependent on elevated NAD levels, and they decline dramatically with age. But NAD also plays with sirtuins that you would get from blueberries or dark chocolate or red wine or, or facetin from wild strawberries or anything else that would be a sirtuin-rich compound. Those two are dependent on each other to be able to protect your DNA from, from unraveling or broken strands. And so for protein repair and DNA repair, you want that one-two combo of a sirtuin-rich diet, like a Mediterranean type of diet, along with intake of NAD. Now, you naturally get a little bit of NAD from strategies, uh, you know, two particularly potent ones would be intake of fermented foods. And also fasting, right? Those will increase NAD levels in and of themselves. But to really get levels boosted up to kind of like the better living through science type of type of uh, approach, you should supplement orally on a daily basis with some well absorbed form of nicotinamide. Typically, that would be oral nicotinamide riboside, oral NR, or sublingual NMN. Either one of those will keep your levels up more than like uh, oral NAD, for example. And what I like for people to do who are really wanting the full effects of NAD supplementation is boost your levels initially with an actual NAD IV, which a lot of practitioners are now administering. And the gold standard is to go into one of these clinics and do anywhere from one to five days of around 500 to 1,000 milligrams of NAD. So you're just blasting your levels through the roof. You can sit there, work on your laptop, uh, you know, get, get the IV. Uh, it's very important. And, and I did appreciate this about your guys' compound when I saw the label that NAD is co-administered with a methyl donor because your, your, your methyl groups get exhausted with a very high level of NAD. It just increases your methylation turnover. So something like trimethylglycine or s acetylmethionine, or I think the one you guys use with betaine. 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 Yep. So you, you want to preferably have that along with the NR or the NAD you know, injection or IV or supplement or however you're doing it. But you get your, your levels elevated. And then once your levels are elevated via intravenous administration, you then just continue to keep them elevated through daily oral supplementation. And if you've been through a period of like hefty airline travel or a bunch of hard workouts, or maybe you're a competitive athlete in a race or something like that, you typically would keep the levels topped off by coming back in for an IV every one to two months. And then the, the only other thing I'll do with NAD is uh, it, it's protective against the type of damage that occurs in response to non-native EMF, right? We know that non-native EMF, 5G has not yet been studied, but we know this is the case with 4G and with Wi-Fi, it can cause some damage to DNA. And so NAD will help to protect against that uh, in addition to magnesium because you get this huge calcium influx in response to non-native EMF. So magnesium helps to offset some of that. And then anything that will upregulate what are called your, your NERF2 pathways, which modulate inflammation. And one of the best ways to do that is ketones or fasting. Mm -hmm. right, so you got you're naming NAD, all my favorite right, things. You got NAD, magnesium, <laughs> and ketones. If you're, if you're surrounded by Wi-Fi all the time, or if you're on some long-haul plane flight, you should definitely do that. But the reason I bring up the long-haul plane flights is I actually found an NAD patch. And so I'll put one of those on my inner thigh prior, you know, if I'm going to, like I'm flying to India next month, right? So Oof, I'll wear that ben. during the flight and I'll get a <laughs> thousand milligrams of NAD into my system transdermally right? because unlike NR and NMN, NAD is better absorbed via IV or transdermal. Right? But if you're going to use oral supplementation, yeah, you use the NMN or the NR, you get a methyl donor along with it. Um, I like that you guys packed it with uh, with astaxanthin too. It's a good thank you. Good we blend. worked hard on that. Yeah. We worked hard yeah. on that with with our friends at Dorn. So you mentioned fish oil, and it made me think of cod liver oil because we have that at home. And it was a tip from our our friend Dr. Alan Vora. We both have young kids. It's like mm -hmm. you try to get your you know again your kids their 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 diets changing all that their their if you, their tastes are changing. Our mm -hmm. daughter like loved eggs, and all of a sudden it was like I'm done with yeah. eggs. Okay, so we're trying to make you know trying to steer her in the right direction at the same time you know let yeah. her exercise her free will a little bit as a three-year-old yep. and so ellen had the great tip of putting a little cod liver oil in a tablespoon and just kind of like sprinkling yeah. it in whatever she has and well, green pastures have like chocolate flavor and the, the, orange we got a lemon oil. it was actually pretty good yeah. i forget the brand There's some tasty but, flavors but like what are your what are your tips when you're you know 
one hand you're trying to let let your child explore and and yeah kind of sneaking in some some good healthy maybe uh foods for them i've got two tips for you and and one interesting anecdote the anecdote is from this wonderful book called nourishment nourishment is about how animals self-medicate and self-select different foods and it turns out that the younger animals like if they're going to look at at sheep in a field the younger sheep will eat far less of the new shoots that have a lot of the bitter forward compounds in them because they've got less cellular damage and need less of those antioxidants so they don't actually have a palate for a lot of the like the bitter kind of plant forward type of compounds but that's okay because they don't need that as much as they need like the proteins, the amino acids, the fatty acids in the more developed and mature plants. And the only time that the young animals will eat more of like the new plants, the bitters, like the, the stuff that we see children also react typically kind of negatively to is if they're given anti-nausea medication, in which case they completely fail to self-select foods properly and they'll eat these new shoots until they throw up because right? it's not making them nausea or, or nauseous as it should. So first from that, we should not necessarily feel guilty about our kids not liking some of the bitters, you know, whether it's coffee or beer all the way down to like, you know, shoots, we're keeping those away from our three year olds. Yeah, now. exactly. Kids fortunately <laughs> don't like that much anyways. Um, but yeah, a lot of these vegetables that you have to develop a palate for kids will develop a palate for that just based on natural self-selection. Now, that being said, the, the two things that I would say are the most important that we do in our house, a everything that's in the house is pretty healthy. Like if you walk into our pantry, it's all glass mason jars with all the legumes and grains and rices, tons of sardines, anchovies, mackerel, herring, canned salmon, canned chicken. You just went through um, smash. Exactly. The entire <laughs> smash diet. Our kids go through that stuff like, I mean, like, like candy, right? They just open up cans of sardines or anchovies or whatever and dump them on their lunch. A lot of avocados, uh, the refrigerators, a lot of ferments, kimchi, sauerkraut, uh, kefir, coconut yogurt. There is mom sourdough bread, typically some really good local raw honeys, some nut butters, you know, some more nutrient dense compounds for the kids and their more, more active lifestyles. And there's just, there's not many packaged foods or cheat foods that the kids have on hand anyways to be able to select from. So that's number one. Number two is that, of course, that scenario can undeniably set up a situation where a child feels that those foods that aren't in the house are forbidden fruit, that the gluten cupcake at Jimmy's birthday party is something that they're going to mow through four of because who knows when they're ever going to see one of those again. Or you know, when they go out to, to, to pizza, right? they're just going to eat as much as they can because you know, all, all they get at home is the sourdough pizza with whatever, you know, beet and goat cheese on it. With so, herring. Right, with herring and anchovies. <laughs> so with with that situation, and, and this is not just for food, it's for screen time, it's for Wi-Fi, it's for exercise, anything like that. We don't tell our kids not to eat something or not to do something or that they must do something. We instead educate them on the consequences of any decision that they may make. Like our kids know gluten inside and out, right? Like they understand that protein, how it could cross the gut blood barrier, how it could cause some neural inflammation, how it must be treated properly. Everything you and I just talked about, they understand that. And so if they're going to go to a birthday party, I mean, it's, it's crazy. Like they'll grab a, a bottle of gluten guardian and they'll take a little bit of restore to protect their guts from the glyphosate. They'll How old go are in, they now? Uh, they're 11 and they'll have a cupcake and, but, but they'll have like, you know, three quarters of a cupcake and they'll, they'll still try these foods, but they're not forbidden fruit. Instead, these kids are educated about the consequences of their decision. And then we let them make the decision. And, um, probably, Probably the only other thing that I think is really important in our house is from a very early age, they have cooked with us. They understand food. They don't fear food. You know, they, they know how to do a risotto and they know how to, you know, reverse sear a steak and they know how to help mom, you know, butcher up a, you know, just a, a whole chicken from the grocery store and how to put that on the pan and roast it. But, you know, simple food prep techniques that they can rely upon. And so, 
I think a child being familiar with the chemistry of food and how, how different parts of food interact, how to make tasty food, and just setting up a scenario where you know the kitchen isn't just a place for, for mom or dad to cook meals, but it's open for everybody to make whatever they'd like. And our kids make huge messes in the kitchen, you know, with all these different waffle and smoothie recipes and you know, make their own personal pizzas and you know, just crazy things. But a good, healthy relationship with cooking is also, I think, really important. I love that. Our our toned down version of that is every Sunday we do our uh our birch benders keto chocolate chip pancakes together. Mm, that sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah. See what what Jessa does is she she uses that that sourdough mix and she makes like a like a sourdough you know waffle mix and sourdough pancake mix and keeps it in a jar in the refrigerator and the kids will use that. That's awesome for their for their pancakes and their waffles. So the last question, you know, what are you excited about? What's interesting to you? What one of the things I love about you is you're a guy who's open to anything. You'll try anything. You don't judge. You see what it, you see what works, what doesn't work. You'll change mm-hmm. your opinion and you sort of move on. And you're at the cutting edge because of that. So what's interesting to you? What do you think we're going to be talking about a year from now? Or besides the the mind body green nicotinamide riboside. <laughs> besides that, um, you know one one field that I'm seeing over and over again pop up in everything from Alzheimer's and dementia research to skin health, like collagen and elastin production to uh, thyroid and testosterone stabilization is this field of photobiomodulation, PBM, which originally was just like low level lasers that some doctor would use in a clinic. And now you can get like these uh, these neurally stimulating devices that you can wear on your head. You know, I'll, I'll wear these in the morning when I'm going through my computer emails that will generate gamma waves and alpha waves and also red and near infrared light to stimulate neural tissue and to cause a release of nitric oxide and to activate what's called cytochrome C oxidase in the mitochondria. So you produce more ATP. Another example of this would be far infrared saunas, uh, these light panels that a lot of companies are now developing. If you look up the research of a guy like uh, Dr. Michael Hamblin on PubMed, the, the number of studies and continually emerging studies on the use of light to heal the body or to interact with the endocrine system or to interact with the neural tissue, it's really intriguing. And it, I, I think not enough people get out in natural sunlight, which has the entire wave of, you know, the entire spectrum of, of light waves that you'd need. But even if you can't do that, I think starting to mess around with some of these like light panels, head worn light devices, um, you know, trying out an infrared sauna instead of a dry sauna. I'm, I'm now using some form of red near or far infrared light just about every day. And it's, it's kind of a, kind of, kind of a, a, a pretty high up on the totem pole when it comes to the health hacks that I use. So we'll have to have you back next year this time. To see the progress, we'll talk yeah. about it. I just haven't figured out how to find a, a safe a safe way to use that stuff for tanning. <laughs> Apparently, there are some UVB, not UVA based tanning beds, but I haven't yet tapped into that. Interesting. Uh, well, yeah. Ben, always a pleasure. Congrats on Boundless, everyone. Pick it up. You don't need dumbbells, barbells, equipment. You got Nothing. Boundless. Just lift the book. Lift the book. You are all set. Congratulations. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks guys. Fun. I want to take a moment to invite you into our Mind Body Green ecosystem where you can explore the infinite possibilities of health and well-being. All you have to do is click the subscribe button to hear more thought-provoking interviews with leaders in the health space. I am so grateful for all of you who have tuned in over the years, and let me tell you, it's only going to get better.